Good morning. On behalf of First Presbyterian Church of Fairfield, I'd like to welcome all of you who are here in the sanctuary today, and for those of you who are at home online worshiping with us, whether you're a member of the church or if this is your first time coming to First Presbyterian Church, we extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. And now we invite you to enter into a time of worship. Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord, let us come into your presence today. Please stand if you're able. Hymn number 138 can be found in the blue hymnal. Please be seated. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with boldness, approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. 
Please join me in saying the prayer of confession. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. In Christ's name, we ask it. And let us take a moment to silently confess our sins. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And please stand for the Gloria Patre. Please be seated.
Good morning. We are in week two of our Gospel of John sermon series. And so week two is John chapter two. If you missed first, the first week, last week, you can listen to that online. The chapter one sets up really the entire book. Uh, we are in the Gospel of John, and we are looking at the Word of God, the Word who was with God in the beginning and who was God, and that is Jesus Christ. And so we get to see God made flesh uh, through Christ. And so today in chapter 2, you are going to get a unique picture of what Christ came to do and who Christ came to be. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Just a little advice, pastoral counsel. Probably don't want to call your mom woman. It is Jesus, but just go ahead and don't follow in his footsteps, right, on this particular term. Woman, it was a Hebrew word of endearment, of affection. It, it's not the way that we might use it here in our day. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Index that in your mind, hour. My hour has not yet come. Very uh, unique, strange thing to say when they say there's, there's no wine. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. My quick math tells me there, that's between 180 and 150 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Last year was the year of the wedding. Across the United States, there were a record-setting number of weddings. 2.3 million couples were wed. On average, those couples spent $34,000 per wedding. If you live in places like New England, the average cost of a wedding was closer to $40,000. Over the course of between 12 and 18 months, couples spent on average between 300 to 400 hours preparing their weddings. The question is, why would 2.3 million couples spend such a massive amount of time, energy, brain power, and money on planning their weddings? The reason is weddings are a big deal. And perhaps to your surprise, in Jesus' day, 
weddings were an even bigger deal. See, the idea of the big wedding is not an American thing or a postmodern thing. It was actually an ancient phenomena, something that those in ancient Israel practice. Weddings were a big deal in Jesus' day. I, I like the way Pastor Mickey Morello of Ridgeway Church captures the magnitude of the Jewish wedding in Jesus' day. Pastor Mickey says, it would have begun with a young man beholding the woman of his dreams. Or more likely, the father of a young man saying, this is the woman of your dreams. The young man would approach the family of the desired bride. And the young man, I'm speaking to young men here, here's just a little bit of advice for you. The young man did not go to the family of the desired bride empty-handed, but went with a contract in hand. It was a marriage contract that outlined what the groom and his family would give in exchange for the bride. It was the bride. Price. And after they agreed upon a bride price, the family members would sit around a table and each member of the family would be poured a cup of wine except for the bride. And when the, the prospective groom drank from his cup of wine, he would slide the cup across the table to his desired bride. And if she drank from the cup, she was pledging herself in holy matrimony to the groom. And if she did not drink from the cup, the groom was out of luck. When she did drink from the cup, the groom got up and said, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And part of the ancient wedding preparations of a groom was to go back to his father's house and either build an addition or renovate a current room where the groom and the bride would start their life together. The groom's family would contact farmers and vineyards to secure food and wine. And I know that there was a lot of food and wine at your four-hour wedding reception, but in ancient Israel, the, the wedding reception did not last three or four hours. It would last for up to a full week. That is a lot of food and wine. Family and friends would travel by foot or donkey for days to attend the celebration of two becoming one flesh. The start of a new family was a big deal in a village. The whole village would attend the wedding. People of held in high esteem from surrounding communities were also invited to the wedding. It was the groom, not the bride and the bride's family, who paid for the wedding. They saved for years to pay for this week-long wedding celebration, the, the celebration of two becoming one flesh, the celebration of a new family and a new Life. As you can see in Jesus' day, weddings were an even bigger deal. The Gospel of John chapter 2 begins with Jesus and his five first disciples attending a wedding in Cana of Galilee, which was a few miles from Jesus' hometown, Nazareth of Galilee. And as soon as Jesus arrives at the wedding, Mary tells Jesus that there is an issue. They have no more wine. And what do you do when you run out of wine in Fairfield or Easton or Monroe or wherever you came from? You run out to the convenience store and you purchase more wine. But in Cana of Galilee, there were no such convenience store, which means when Mary declared there is no more wine, there was really no more wine and no place to get more wine. And for some of you, if you're like my dad, wine's a big deal. Not a big deal to me, but to some of you, oh, it's this wine, and 
Uh, what are you having for dinner? And you match the wine. And if wine is a big deal to you, just know that in Jesus' day, wine was an even bigger deal. The rabbis, the, the pastors had a saying about wine, which seems kind of unbecoming of a pastor or a rabbi. The rabbis would say, there is no rejoicing except with wine. C can you believe that? No wine, no joy. The, 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 there's a biblical teacher, his name is James Boyce, and, and he, says that, he, he says that an abundance of wine would mean an abundance of joy. Wine was a symbol of joy. And, and, and it wasn't joy because you drank so much wine that you're drunk or now you're participating in some sort of revelry or, or now you can, hey, you finally had a drink, now you can cut loose. It wasn't about any of those things for the Jewish people. In fact, drunkenness would strictly be forbidden. Wine in, in their day, one historian says, was one part wine, three parts water. Someone say yummy. The, the alcohol content was close to 1%. Uh, some historians say that, that the Israelites would use wine to hydrate. My advice is don't try that at home. But wine was a big deal. It was a symbol of, of joy. It was a symbol of the joy that, that the holy matrimony represented and the joy that God would bestow upon this couple throughout their lives as husband and wife. And running out of wine was a major embarrassment. In fact, for, for, for a bride, it, you know, the, the, the idea of we don't want it to rain on our wedding or, or some other nightmare that you would have, but for the bride and the groom, running out of wine was really their wedding nightmare. It came with great social embarrassment. It would be the only thing that anyone would ever remember about your wedding. In fact, running out of wine was such a big deal that you could be sued, held liable by the bride's family for not fulfilling your covenant, your contract. Running out of wine was a big deal. No wine, no joy, no wine. No wedding, Mary says to Jesus, they have no more wine. Jesus says, woman, why do you involve me in the wine situation? And here is something interesting. Ought to make your ears perk up. He says, my hour, my hour has not yet come. Throughout the Gospel of John, I counted five times, perhaps there's more. Jesus refers to his hour. And when he makes reference to his hour, he is making reference to the hour of his death. And, and I don't know what you think about at weddings. I tend to think, I sure hope there's more cake, amen? At, at this wedding, Jesus, at a wedding, Jesus is thinking about his death. At the very start of his ministry, Jesus' mind wanders to the very end of his earthly ministry. At the wedding, Christ himself, in this joyous place, is thinking about the cross. His mind, his heart, is fixed on Calvary. They have no more wine, it's my time to die, is what Christ says. And then there are many ways that, that Christ could show himself to be Lord over nature, ruler over creation, creator God. And, and, and if he wanted to turn water into wine, the, the most convenient way to do it, I believe, especially for the waiting staff, would be to take the, the water jugs, excuse me, the wine jugs that were now empty or the wine skins that were now empty and fill those 
with wine, right? Take the vessels that have been designated for wine, fill them with water, and turn them into wine, and now you'll have more wine. Vessels suitable for serving you wine. Yet, the scripture tells us, while there was, while there was all these empty wineskins and wine jugs, that Christ chooses six stone jars that were designed for, designated for ceremonial washing. They were not made to serve, to hold wine. Yet Christ says to the servants, fill these stone jars with water. And then he uses the ceremonial washing jars as vessels and he turns the water into wine. And so the question becomes, why would Christ, who is intentional, calculated, and strategic, why would he use the ceremonial washing jars, jars used for water, and turn the water into wine? What is he trying to tell you this morning? What is the message that Christ is trying to convey through the ceremonial washing jars? John notes the detail, so we note the detail. The ceremonial washing jars, of course, were used by Jews when they would enter into a house to wash their hands. And they would wash their hands, and they would wash their hands up to their elbows. You know the ancient Jews were ahead of my children. Not only did they have ceremonial washing jars at Jewish homes used for washing before the meal, but in the temple courts, Outside of the temple in the city of Jerusalem, they had stone jars reserved for ceremonial washing because the idea was before sinners could go before God, meet with God in his temple, they would have to be washed, that you would have to wash away your impurities, that you would have to be cleansed, that you could not go in the presence of holy God with all your spiritual impurities, that sinners could not go before God without first being cleansed. Jesus orders the servants to place the water into the wine, to place the water into the jars, and he uses these ceremonial washing jars to do this miracle of turning water into wine. What is he trying to communicate with you? After the servants served the wine to all their guests, there would be a Jewish toast. The master of the banquet would raise his cup, the master of the banquet, the toastmaster, and he would say some sort of Jewish blessing. Blessed be the God of the universe who brings forth the fruit of the vine, and then they would all drink from the cup. As I was pondering the master of the banquet holding the cup of wine and blessing it, my mind was brought to the end of Jesus' ministry, even at the start of Jesus' ministry. And you know what Christ did with the cup at the end of his ministry. Most of us do. On the night that they were to celebrate the Jewish Passover, Jesus' last supper, he took the cup filled with wine, and he said, this cup is the new covenant, sealed with my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin, and then they all drank the wine. What Christ is communicating to us, the wine at the, at the wedding in Cana of Galilee is, is a foreshadowment of the blood that would be shed during his hour, the very blood of the Lamb of God that does what the water was unable to do, and that is make sinners clean in the eyes of God. The miracle of water into wine is a message of what Christ came to do. It is a foreshadowment of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And you know Christ held up that cup 
on the Passover night. It was in remembrance of the lamb that was slain, whose blood was shed and smeared on doorposts, through whose blood the ancient Israelites were freed from bondage and set on their way into the promised land. It was the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, that frees us from sin and death. Everyone else want to take a deep breath? The wine is a sign of who Christ came to be. This is why John says this was the first sign. So let me give you the, the second part. Because the second part shows us who Christ came to be, right? We see what Christ came to do during his hour. But, but let's see who Christ came to be. Isn't it great when someone else gets credit for the things that you do? Don't you enjoy that? <laughs> you do all the work and someone else takes the credit. But I think there's a message in this. So Christ makes the best wine that anyone's ever tasted. And the master of the banquet tastes the water that had been turned into wine. And the Bible says that he did not realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, then he called the bridegroom, the groom aside, and said, everyone, all the other grooms, bring out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you, you're, you're the best groom ever because you saved the best Till now. The groom gets all the credit for saving the best wine for last. In ancient Israel, it is the groom who provides the wine. Pastor Tim Keller says that the God of the Bible relates to us as father and children, a shepherd to his flock, a king to his subjects, and God relates to us as a groom to his bride. In fact, Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew calls himself the groom, the bridegroom. John the Baptist in John chapter 3 says, when, when the people are coming out to John the Baptist and saying, are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? John the Baptist says this, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. John the Baptist is testifying saying, Jesus Jesus is the groom. Jesus is the bridegroom. And Jesus is teaching us throughout Scripture that he is the bridegroom. Why is Jesus Christ thinking about his hour of death at a wedding? Because when Christ is thinking about his hour, he is thinking about what it will take to invite you and I to the wedding at the end of days. He's thinking about what it will take to welcome you and I into God's kingdom, into God's family. What it's going to take to make the church the wife of Christ the groom. And on the cross, Christ pays the bride price, right? He drinks of the cup. And as a result of his work on the cross, and, and I know perhaps you haven't been taught this at church, I don't know what you've been taught, but what awaits those who follow Jesus Christ, who are willing to drink of his cup in this life, is a wedding. You, you ask yourself again and again, what does heaven look like? And I've done a million funerals. And when it's a funeral for a golfer, I say, they're, they're on a golf course. When it's a funeral for an animal lover, I, uh, they're on a farm. But if you want a true picture of what heaven looks like, you need to look no further than a wedding party. And the weddings that we host... With, with all the time and energy and money and, and extravagant gifts are nothing compared to the wedding that God has prepared for those who love and follow Christ in this life. The Bible begins with a wedding, Adam and Eve. Throughout the Old Testament, in the middle of the Bible, God refers to himself as husband and Israel his wife. And then the end of the Bible, it ends with a great wedding feast. This is what John writes in Revelation 21. He says, I 
saw it the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. And here's a picture, right, of two becoming one. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And you know what there's an absence of at the wedding? at the wedding feast of God and God's people. He says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's no sorrow at this wedding. There will be no more death. There's no death at this wedding or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. There's an absence of all the effects of sin and death. And there's the presence of joy. There's an abundance of wine. So here's where we're in this morning. How do I participate in this wedding? Christ came as groom. He paid the bride price so that we could be one with God now and forever. So that we can participate in an eternal abundance of joy in God's presence forever. How do I, how do I get to go? I've been to probably, I've lost count, a lot of weddings. But, but this is the one that surpasses all. And this is, would be my advice to you today. And, you know, take it or leave it. But, but this would be my advice. Start where Mary starts. You remember what, what Jesus' mom said to, to Jesus? They have no more wine. If you see yourself as a, as a jar, as an earthen vessel, as the Apostle Paul calls us, earthen vessel. If you were to see yourself as, as an earthen vessel, a jar, what if you started by saying, I'm empty? Lord, I, I need you to fill me. I, I, I've tried to be good. I've, I've tried to keep my nose clean. And, and it hasn't worked out. And I'm tired of walking without you and running without you. Fill me. Fill me with your spirit. I'm running on empty. Come into my heart. I'm, I need the water of your spirit. I need the wine of your forgiveness. You just ask the Lord to, to fill you, to come to you. Second, we make Christianity very complicated. Uh, we all have better ideas than what the Bible tells us to do, and often we implement those. Mary says to the servants, do whatever he says. Do whatever Jesus says. Your idea of how you should live your life is not better than Jesus's. I, I think that's amen worthy. Your best idea is worse than Jesus' worst idea. Hallelujah. Do whatever he says. Following Christ is the hardest thing you'll ever do, but I'll tell you what, it sure is simple. You know what we, we, we say in Christian jargon when we say do whatever he says? We would say, submit to the lordship of Christ. Well, you call Jesus Lord, make him Lord. Do whatever he says. And third, who gets all the glory for bringing out the Brunello, the Bordello, the whatever it's called, the, the Bordeaux, the, the finest wine? During the story, who does the master of the banquet give all the credit, all the glory, all the praise to? The groom. The groom gets all the praise in the worship. Number three, prepare for the wedding by giving the groom, Jesus Christ, all the credit, all the glory, and all the worship for all things in your life. Christ is the wine. Christ provides the wine. And the greatest wedding awaits all those who follow Christ in this life. And this wedding is the biggest deal. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please stand if able as we say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray together. Lord, as we remember on this day the process through which you took upon yourself to forgive the sins of the world, it was in your crushing that we were made whole. It was in your being pierced that we were healed. It was when you were poured out that you made a way for us to be filled with your grace and mercy and love and salvation. And so, Lord, on this day, some have come and they feel crushed. They feel crushed by the burdens of life. They feel burdened by the pains of growing old. They feel pressured by the demands of this life. And so we remember, God, that just as through the crushing of grapes comes new wine, that even in our crushing, even when we are being pressed upon on every side, that it is in those moments that you are making new wine, that you are turning us into some, something and someone that can be tasted and so that others can see that the Lord is good. You waste no sickness, you waste no death, you waste no pain or hardship, you use it all for your glory. And Lord, we lift up to you on this day, beloved members of our congregation, our family, your family, your bride. We lift up to you the Hitchcock family as they continue, and our church family as we continue to mourn the death of Dot Hitchcock. We lift up to you our beloved brother and choir member, David Hill, and we thank you, God, for his life and his ministry to us. We lift up to you the McKinney family and all those who are grieving the passing of her brother-in-law, Tommy. Robin blows and Roger blows as they, God, continue to persevere through a difficult hour in time. We lift up to you the Huth family and our beloved sister, Pam, as she remembers and grieves the, the death of her husband. So Lord, during this time, we come before you, we come to you knowing that you are filled with love, that you are the groom who lays down his life and there's nothing that you wouldn't do. So walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death and God. Walk with us and renew our joy where there is an abundance of wine, there is an abundance of joy. You are our joy. And so, God, even in difficult times, we look to you and we see our, our hope, our, our love, our salvation, and our joy. We thank you, Jesus, that you have chosen us, that on this day we do not walk alone, but we are bonded, covenanted to you. So thank you, Lord. And hear us now as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
We are excited because for the next 10 weeks, we will be teaching on Sundays from the Gospel of John. In the back of the sanctuary, there are reading plans. These are five-day reading plans that will enable you to read over the next five weeks through the first half of the Gospel of John daily. After the five weeks are up, we will give you another Gospel of John reading plan. We, it's a little nibble. It's a little bite of John every day. It's not too much, but something that we hope and pray will stick with you and be the spiritual fuel that you need to serve God and know God daily. Also, this is the last week to sign up for a Gospel of John small group, and those groups are listed in the back of your bulletin. If, if you are interested in joining a group, you can grab an RSVP card at the end of your pew, and you can write under the word attend. The men's group, if you would like to join the men's group. The women's group, if you would like to join the women's group. And you can write mixed Zoom, if you would like to join the mixed group that is on Zoom, or mixed in person for our 1030 AM Gospel of John in person group. Also, after our service at 1030 next week, we will have our annual meeting. So we invite all to attend our annual meeting. And today, uh, we will be hosting prayer in our reading room, which when you go out the sanctuary, you take a right, your, the reading room is on your right. And so if you came in here needing prayer or someone in your life who you'd like to pray for, our prayer team would be honored to pray with you. And lastly, after we sing our doxology, hymn number 156 is found in your insert, Sing to God Made Manifest. So we invite you to follow along with your insert. If you brought an offering today, you are welcome to place your offering in the offering basket on your way out. If you're joining us online today, you're welcome to give your gift online or to send in a check. We praise God from whom all blessings flow. Please stand if able as we sing our doxology.
After Christ turned water into wine, the disciples saw the sign and they believed and followed him. As we go from this place, may we believe and follow him. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the new wine, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon each one of us on this day until we meet our groom again. And God's beloved bride says together, Amen.